Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for joining this EMB event. We're really excited to have everybody here and making sure that you have as much information as we can provide you about everything happening in COVID related information, especially as it pertains to things happening in Sacramento, in California, and trying to just provide you that type of information. I will be your moderator today, and my name is Graciela Castillo Krings. I am a lobbyist for Sacramento Advocates who also represents California EMB. And with me are my two colleagues, Holly and Sosen, and they will introduce themselves shortly. But just to tell you a little bit about myself, I have actually dedicated most of my career in public service and spent 15 years in the actual public sector. And my um, previous to my lobbying position now, I was actually with Governor Jerry Brown. So happy to kind of move on to Holly or Sosen and have them introduce themselves. Hi everyone, Holly from Mini De Jesus. I'm a partner here with Lighthouse Public Affairs in Sacramento, in the Sacramento office. Some of you I know take know our firm, we're a Bay Area based firm with offices in San Francisco, Oakland, um, and down in the Silicon Valley and San Rafael. In, in San Rafael. Um, so I, my, my history here before um, coming to Lighthouse is I've actually been in Sacramento for over 20 years. Um, I actually as a lobbyist, unlike Graciela, most of my tenure has been as a lobbyist in what we refer to as the third house. And over the last 10 years, specifically been um, working on the lobbying on housing policy. So most of the, the bills that have landed on the governor's desk in the last, you know, in 10 years specifically, I've had my, my fingers have been on in some way, shape or form. Um, and, and prior to joining Lighthouse, I actually had a lot of work at the local government level. And I worked um, for, I know it feels like forever how many governors it was ago, but I came to Sacramento working for Pete Wilson and also for um, Gray Davis. Um, so I have a long history here of um, bipartisan um, work experience and um, really have enjoyed working on housing policy. And Sosin is my colleague that shares many clients on housing today, Habitat for Humanity, California EMB. We work with the Three P's Coalition as well on housing policy and, and Sosin has been a partner on most of the legislation we've worked on over the last few years. Great, um, thanks. Hi everyone, my name is Sosin Madina. As Holly said, I um, work with her at Lighthouse Public Affairs. I um, have been with the firm for a little over two years um, when, as soon as they opened their Sacramento office. Um, I joined the firm previously working for um, a civic education nonprofit based in the California Chamber of Commerce. And prior to that, um, had worked in the Capitol for a state senator as well as in the governor's office of legal affairs. And prior to that, actually what brought me to Sacramento was attending McGeorge um, Law School. So I've been in Sacramento for about nine years now and with the firm for a little over two and have been working primarily on um, housing legislation with Holly, um, as she mentioned. And I'm very excited to be here today to share a little bit of the knowledge that we have from the work that we've been doing. Thanks. And before we begin, I just also wanted to thank our partners in crime for helping us put this together, the Bay Area Housing Advocacy Coalition. Thank you so much. And also to everybody on this call who's participating. So with that, let's dive into some of the questions that I know you guys are very excited to hear about. Um, the first one that I have is, so Holly and Sosin, um, what can you tell the public about the legislature and how COVID has actually impacted the ability for them to move forward with the voting process that they have and just legislation and how the community can actually continue to participate in that process. I can start and take that one. I think uh, many of you know it's been uh, interesting times. Again, 18 years that I've been in Sacramento and lobbying and this is unprecedented times to have the legislature just come to a screeching halt um, on March, you know, on March 16th and 17th with no warning um, to any of us we, that we're still having our lobby days and in the Capitol just the week before and conducting business as usual and then just immediately, um, you know, just two days before the shelter in place order happened, the legislature adjourned. Um, the Senate and Assembly both took actions and they gave the governor um, broad authority and a lot of money to spend um, to immediately deal with the, the crisis and COVID-19 and spend money that was directly related to emergency response. And they left it open-ended, um, really, at that point in time. It was, they thought they, they said, you know, we hope to be back by April um, the 30th, but, you know, no, no dates were set in stone, and that things would, we would just continue to play by ear. At that point, too, a lot of you may or may not know, but different rules were also adopted on the floor that day. Um, the Senate took action to allow them to do remote voting and, and conduct business remotely, but the Assembly on that day um, didn't, um, you know, 
take the same actions. And it's, it's interesting, this is just a reminder how separate and different the houses are procedurally. They have different lawyers that advise them and rules of each house are very, very different. Um, so different rules were adopted and those different rules have different consequences in the interim. Um, and, and so now you know, we're, this is a very timely webinar because even just this morning and, and just yesterday, this is the week that we've been gave, getting more information of when they're coming back on May 4th, the if is now over, they are coming back. <laughs> so it's not a matter of if, it's just how they're gonna be coming back and how they're gonna be conducting business and which bills are still gonna be heard. Um, but whether or not they are coming back or not, the question has now been answered. They definitely are. Policy committees will be resuming um, on March 4th. They're gonna be very, very different, obviously. Um, both houses have strongly encouraged, they're trying not to dictate and tell people which bills should or should not move forward, but they have, are, they're strongly encouraging them to use the filter of what is a direct relation to COVID response, what are bills that have to be adopted this year, because there was a lot of problems that pre, that pre um, existed before that pandemic and issues that need to be dealt with, housing crisis, obviously the state's been in the housing crisis for years before now. Um, addiction issues, mental health issues. I mean, a lot of the education issues, there's a lot of issues that have to be dealt with before the end of the year and those bills will continue to move forward. But they have kind of said, I call it the nice to have bills. The bills that are nice to have, a lot of those will be dropped and postponed until next year um, because it looks like the committees, each committee may only meet one time. Um, some may but two, but they're trying to reduce the workload for the committees to hear in one policy committee hearing. Members, we just—I just recently, just literally within an hour, read the memo that said it sounds like members will be present in voting, and the member presenting the bill may be present in voting. But testimony is not actually a constitutional right. It's not a right that anybody has to testify on behalf of a bill, um, you know, in person. So they're doing their best to figure out a way for people to be able to testify, at least primary witnesses and experts, which some may be remotely um, conferenced in via video, just like we're doing now. Um, to make sure that the, the legislators are voting with all the information that they need to vote. But there will not be a long line, which we all used to joke about the conga lines in the committee rooms, the people that fly to town and stand in line to just state their name on the record and say which side of the uh, bill that they're voting for. Instead, it looks like that's gonna be via remote calling and teleconference. That those of you, you'll save a lot of money this year not having to come to the Capitol. That's the one good news. Um, but the other news is, we're gonna need a lot of people calling in. When it's time to call in and testify, we need lots of people calling in and stating your name for the record and what side of the bill you're on. It's now gonna be more important than ever to respond to the calls of action. I hope everybody on this call is on Yimby's listserv and as a tax listserv, I hope you're already signed up for all those action alerts of all the organizations that you care about and that you um, agree with their positions on legislation. More than ever in my career, am I stressing and can't stress enough to respond to those calls to action, write letters, make phone calls, send emails, comment on legislation on your social media sites and posts and like. And, and I always say it's better to even make a comment than say a like on a legislator's page, but they have a lot of extra time on their hands and they are watching and reading um, the things on social media. So now more than ever, when you're asked, I just strongly suggest you're asked to make a call to action and participate in um, the committee hearing because a bill is up. Now the good news is, and again, you don't have to take a day off work and, um, and come to Sacramento, but we will be, I strongly advise everyone to weigh in and participate because you know, the good and the bad news is now everybody can have access to participate. It's just in a very different manner or method. And would it be fair to also say and clarify that we're hearing for sure that the assembly is hoping to come back May 4th. There seems to be a little more ambiguity about where the, where the Senate is gonna be because I keep hearing a little fluidity in the date. And so I'm not sure if you guys have heard the same thing, but that's one of the things that I kind of wanted to kind of clarify. Again, the rules, uh, the, the assembly rules, I mean, they both, nobody has officially made any statements yet of what's official. I think they're all very nervous of saying anything official because as soon as they do, it could change again. And it's hard, um, to, to guess, but but at least you know I think some of you on a webinar yesterday and a, and a, and a cast a webcast that had Assemblymember Ting, um, Senator Weiner, and Assemblymember Chu that were all you know chairs of committees. Even Senator Weiner expressed confidence um, that a reduced bill load would be heard in at least one policy committee that his um, his committee his housing committee would have in the Senate. But again, when 
um, is not for the, the Senate. When those committees will actually start is a little uncertain. Um, but they also have a lot less bills. They don't have as many committees, so they don't have as much of a workload to wrangle in as the assembly does. And also, to just kind of finish the timeline I started, at least what it's been said for those who, you know, taking notes and writing down, it does look like they're going to try to actually get back on track, reduce their workload so much that they could be back on track and actually still recess over the summer, which is shocking to some people, but they mm -hmm. have said that they're hoping that they're reducing their workload so much and the number of committee hearings so much that they could handle all the bills that they, they visualize are necessary and must pass um, within a three week period. They could still conduct the appropriations committee hearings over the next two weeks and still have floor session. Um, floor session also may be somewhere remote, like it could be at the Golden One Arena or something to allow the members to be um, separated or in the Memorial Auditorium. They haven't figured the logistics out yet. But again, like they're expressing optimism that they could even reduce the workload so much they could be back on track um, to meet that summer recess. And then I guess one more deadline and one more action that has to take place, which is constitutional, um, is the budget it has to be approved by um, June 15th, that's a constitutional deadline. So that is also um, on top of everything I just described, the budget process, which as many of you know, is a separate process and all these deadlines I was just referred to aren't even applicable in the budget process. But um, the budget committee is expected to, and, and is to take, continue to do informational hearings and the legislature is still on track to at least vote on the budget um, on June 15th. And then they'll vote on another version of the budget in, in August, but we can talk even longer about that, but I'll try to keep it short. So as you guys kind of heard Holly mention, Legislative offices are still open. Feel free to call them, email them, text them, go on your social media feed, let them know what your thoughts are, what your questions are. They're also here to help. So just because they're not in Sacramento doesn't mean that they're closed. Um, so with that, really quickly, the next question that we are hearing a lot about is what's going on at the local level, right? There's a lot of um, different planning departments that have different ways of operating right now. And what we're trying to figure out is um, we're hearing that local housing plans may be delayed. Is that something that you are hearing? And what does it mean for housing elements that are underway? Well, I think right now I'm taking the lead on some of these responses just because my child is occupied and quiet. Just so you know, I may be, I just think of the caveat, she may come over here. So Stosin will be um, taking over. Um, but I, I think I, this was when we kind of separate some of the topics and themes, and this is what I was going to talk about. The, I think right now there's so much uncertainty at the local level, and I think um, especially in the Bay Area, and I know a lot of you are on the call are from the Bay Area, and having the variances and ordinances that have been passed in the Bay Area is much stricter, and is nearly all construction has come to a halt except for all, any, all construction, housing construction, except for affordable, you know, separate projects that have 10% or, or more affordability are the only ones that are still underway. and and it really has, you know, just halted everything in the economy when it comes to that in the Bay Area. And I think even right now, no one's quite talking about it yet. Um, but those arena numbers, I think when you're referring to housing elements or the regional housing numbers, I think is what you're referring to, Graciela. And there's, and there's goals and objectives and requirements that cities are supposed to meet even before construction came to an end. And they're getting this now two to three month hiatus of no construction um, and hopefully not much longer than that. Um, before it's back up and running, but the detriment not only to the projects and the pipe that are in the pipeline and under construction and the economics that are involved in that, um, the timelines now for even some of those cities to even meet some of the goals that they already had, those, those goals are now um, are going to have to be modified. So I think we're going to be expecting to see legislation. I haven't seen it quite yet, but I think there will be legislation that gets introduced that's very specific to housing elements um, to give some grace to those cities that are good actor, I like to call them kind of the good actor cities. We all know some of the bad actor cities, but some of the good actor cities are on track to meet their housing goals and have it planned. Like I think they'll start being some modifications um, to that because it's gonna be nearly impossible um, for some cities to meet some of the original goals and objectives that they had. And for the next round of the RENA cycle, I think all of those deadlines and timelines are now gonna end up having to be um, you know, we're going to have to be modified, especially when the call to action and the cry outcry is coming from those good actor pro housing cities. They're begging for dates to change because they don't want to get sued. 
the legislature and the governor's office and the administration will likely respond to those outcries by those cities, but also balancing to make sure that they're not giving another loophole or another out um, for other cities to not move forward with housing. So, um, so is there anything else you want to add on that as it relates to locals? No, I think Holly covered most of it. Um, we recognize that um, there have been, there's been a bit of a piecemeal effort here and that the governor is really deferring to a lot of the local governments. So it does make it a lot more challenging. Um, and it makes it hard to track what exactly is happening where. Um, that's a big part of what we've been doing um, both at the local level and at the state level as we have conversations with, you know, our clients and stakeholders. And I think to Holly's point, you know, that, that may um, ultimately, um, you know, impact and create some delays as a lot of these cities um, and local jurisdictions determine how to move forward. Um, part of that is funding and part of it is just um, reduced staff and whatnot. But so we're gonna keep an eye out and we'll be continuing to watch um, and monitoring what, what happens. But as Holly said, we may see some legislation on that moving forward. Well, and that actually, so since following up on that point then, if we are gonna see legislation moving forward this year, given that the actual timeline has been there's a lot of uncertainty around the legislative timeline and we're all trying to figure this out together. So what, what would you say is going to happen to housing bills this year and what does that mean? Is, so can you give us a little insight in that? Sure. Um, so I think as Holly said, we're going to see a lot more of the need to have bills and some of the nice to have bills are going to be put on hold. So we're, we are looking at, um, and in conversations even yesterday with um, some of the, the folks on the um, SF Hack webinar with uh, Chairman Chu, um, Assemblymember Ting, and Senator Weiner, we talked, um, and they talked a lot about, you know, primary focus this year is going to be on homelessness and uh, many of the bills that are, you know, streamlining uh, homeless housing and emergency housing to provide um, for folks that are on the street right now, some of the folks that are most vulnerable, we're going to see those moving forward, um, as well as some production bills and um, recognizing, as, as they said themselves, that trying to encourage production bills right now in this time is incredibly um, vital because it really does help put people back to work, as well as housing um, folks that, you know, maybe housing insecure right now or, um, you know, looking for, for homes because uh, supply is down at this point. So we're really trying to encourage housing to boost the economy, to get people back at work and to get folks housed. Um, and I think, you know, there, there are a number of bills that we're working on, you know, for, for some of our clients, California YIMBY, um, Habitat for Humanity, particularly, that try to help streamline the process to building, you know, like um, the Robert Revis bill 3155 that really encourages streamlining for um, 10 units or less that provides, you know, home ownership opportunities for folks in smaller, more naturally affordable homes. We're also seeing a lot of other bills that are streamlining um, as it relates to CEQA and zoning, um, housing for homeless, such as Assemblymember Ting's bill um, that takes from a, a previous pilot program in certain cities that allows for mm -hmm. streamlined um, housing uh, for folks that are housing insecure or experiencing homelessness. So I think that it's really going to limit the number of bills as Holly previously mentioned. And we are gonna be seeing that legislators are gonna focus on the most urgent and pressing needs, as well as looking at bills that will help stimulate the economy as we start to come out of the um, recession or as we start, start to come out of the pandemic itself and, and are recognizing that we may be entering a recession, how do we encourage um, stimulating the economy and getting folks housed? I was just gonna add to that and, and, and just a, another thing to keep in mind with the bills that can stay alive is the, the fiscal situation of not just the state and the, and the state is actually will be about six months behind just because of the way the fiscal um, calendars work than the local governments. But local governments and cities just this week um, are projecting six, they're already six billion short right now um, from the TOT taxes, which is their, their tourism taxes, um, sales tax and gas tax, uh, as you just can imagine, has just been annihilated. There's many cities right now on uh, that are going to be declared, they're not going to have a choice but to declare bankruptcy. Um, counties and cities can, under federal law, declare bankruptcy, but I, you know, the state can't declare bankruptcy. There's even a member of Congress today that was I'm throwing an idea out um, that maybe they need to change the federal law to allow states to declare 
declare bankruptcy. Um, just because of the situation that we're in is unprecedented. No other recession or anything can compare to um, the situation that all the states, um, California specifically, and our cities are in because we're, they're so dependent on those, ta those other taxes. Um, because our whole tax system is just very different than other, other, um, other states because of property taxes and Prop Proposition 13 and things. So our state and the fiscal situation is very different. So any bill that has appropriations and might have, oh, there's you saying hi. Hi. Any, any, any bill um, that has an, a cost or a local mandate for cities and counties, I think will be scrutinized and may not even have a chance of making it unless it were put into a budget trailer bill or somehow funded through budget funding. And, and that's open because again, there's money in the budget for homelessness. There is money in the budget. Even already there was money in the budget for tenant protection. So there could be some modifications to some existing budget dollars reappropriated to help fund some legislation that needs to pass. But I think as Phil Ting said yesterday in a webinar, impact fees, um, you know, those are issues that are, are of course we all know are increase the cost of construction are unfair in every city to city they vary but those bills that were aimed at trying to reduce them or have equity from city to city it's going to be much harder um to i never want to say any bill is ever dead because you you just never know in this in this world any any anyone a package that gets put together it could include some relief on impact fees so i never want to say anything like but it's just much harder um to cap them and do anything that's a one size fits all but i definitely think everyone's saying one size fits all when it comes to funding for again cities will be tough but if, if, if there's some cities that are doing things differently and have more money than others then um, you may have some variances but the state is going to be extremely cautious to any bill that might cost the general fund or cities and counties than it does today and just and just to give everybody kind of a little bit of context the um, assembly budget met earlier this week to kind of do an oversight hearing of all of the executive orders and how much money the state has been spending to date and the legislative analyst office basically gave some really staggering numbers. So just to put it in context, the general fund is about $147 billion. We are already looking um, in the last month, a revenue loss of 35 billion. That just kind of shows you how bad the projections are gonna be moving forward. And we don't even know or fully have a good understanding of how bad it's gonna get. Right? This is just some projections that we're seeing because of the, the way the economy had to shut down. And so we're, we don't know how long it's going to last. We don't know how this is going to change the economic, um, basically economic climate in our state. And just, but just to give you a quick preview, we're in a very different position than we were at the beginning of the year. And so I think, thankfully, because California does have that rainy day fund, we're going to be able to weather it better than in a, the previous recessions. But it just gives you a little bit of context in terms of when the legislature does come back, some of the things that they're going to be looking at and where a, a bill might be a great policy, but if it's going to cost a lot of money, already going in and when there's a deficit, that's going to make it very difficult. Well, thank yeah. you. Just to that point really quickly, I think, um, you know, Holly mentioned this briefly, but we're looking at the budget in, in June, right, which is a constitutional deadline that they're going to be passing just a base budget. And that I think, to, as what Graciela is saying as well, is why we're, um, the legislature is going to be reevaluating what revenues may be coming in between um, June and August that may help us determine what we're able to do, but essentially creating new programs um, and and reducing money that local jurisdictions are going to be able to, um, you know, use for their programs at this point, um, we've been told are a non starter. So we we do hope that there'll be um, legislation and these will be bills that we'll be able to um, come back to next year. Um, but at this point, we're really looking at um, a pretty basic in terms of what we're able to to fund and and what we're able to afford as a state and i also think some new life i will just say is being breathed into a bill that other people may have seen uh, or may have thought was a non-starter which david you mentioned um yesterday on the conference call was his proposal to um reduce the tax deduction um for mortgage interest taxes because they're really i think there's a what this pandemic is doing is um you know it's bringing even more focus on the fact that there's no permanent source of funding for housing in the state like well there just there isn't um and even though there's, there's some the good news is for some of you that may or may not know this there are bond dollars fortunately from the the bonds that just passed just a couple of years ago 
that have refunded you know some um, programs like Cal, Cal Home and there's and there's money for the you know for um, cap and trade. There at least fortunately is some dollars and um, that are getting out for projects and applications that are in and some projects that are getting funded. So fortunately there are some government dollars that are there and there's some tax credits that are a little bit even but like. I think we've lost Holly. And upside down. And I think so some proposals that in the past were like in non-starters um, on looking at people's like interest deductions, people are saying no way and would ever go for that. But politically in this environment, the politics might shift because every, I don't think any, I mean, there's no, I should say any, I, I don't think there's no district and assembly district or Senate district immune from the crisis and the housing crisis that just got exacerbated. People can't pay their mortgages, people can't pay their rent. Um, and now there's more need for more funding than ever. So there might be now an appetite to maybe get the votes that are needed for some major um, proposals like David Chu's and, and changing the mortgage interest deduction. So it'll be interesting to see how this plays out in the next few months. Great, um, and with that, we actually have quite a few questions in the queue from the public and I'm gonna turn over really quickly and start kind of addressing some of those. Um, so our first question comes from Dorothy and her question is, um, will the NIMBYs, you, the NIMBYs may use the pandemic as an excuse to oppose density. What should we prepare to do to thwart this? Great question. I think one of the things we can, um, we can look and say is we have very dense cities in California, but when you actually look at the projections of where the deaths and numbers of, of people that are getting infected has been, it actually really goes back to how we deal with social distancing, the ability of making sure that people are washing their hands, doing what they can, kind of continuing to be responsible for their actions. I don't think there's a direct correlation, obviously, between just because you're dense means that you're going to have higher incidences. Um, but just it's one of those things that I think there's going to be a lot of analysis once we're done with this and what's going on, what actually practices work better than others. And you can see that there's a lot of different examples in different cities throughout the U.S. that actually can um, be good, good uh, examples of that. Yeah, and I think to that point, um, we've seen studies that have come out of New York. While New York has been hit very hard, it doesn't necessarily always correlate with density. Um, and I know that California YIMBY also has some information about that and some resources um, as well. So I would encourage folks to, um, to connect with California YIMBY and um, explore the website as well um, and look at some of the information that they have directly related to that. Um, I think folks that are NIMBYs generally are going to find, um, you know, lots of different excuses to try to avoid that. But to Graciela's point, I think that there are a lot of uh, different things that we can point to um, and density isn't necessarily um, the, the thing that holds the strongest correlation to um, an uptick in the infection rate during this time. Our next question comes from Wendell and it's what sort of progress is being made with safely housing the homeless? and where are they being housed? Um, I'm happy to jump in there. Um, I, it's a great question. Um, um, I think early on in the pandemic, shortly after the governor declared a state of emergency that occurred on March 4th, if I understand, if I remember correctly, um, he actually issued housing and um, homelessness were the issues that he focused on very early on in this pandemic. And he um, essentially allocated $150 million to help address the homelessness crisis. And we have seen that money um, is able to be used by local jurisdictions to help house folks. And we're seeing many um, individuals uh, that are experiencing homelessness that are currently able to live in hotels and motels. And that is through Project Room Key, which the governor's office has created, um, essentially to really help those most vulnerable, whether they're um, experiencing symptoms or they are, um, uh, at 65 and older, or they themselves have um, health care, health issues um, that make them at higher risk. And um, that has been extremely successful from last count, as far as I understand. We, the state had secured over 10,000 rooms to help um, house a lot of those individuals and to get them off the street to reduce the, um, the risk that they pose to themselves and to others in terms of spreading. 
So it has been a huge priority for the governor um, and for the legislature to uh, address that those vulnerable populations. I would just add to that too. I think every city and local jurisdiction is also supplementing the state action with um, creative ideas that have been discussed for years, but there was never, again, the political approval or acceptance of some of those, like putting homeless in the hotels and vacant rooms was something people have talked about that in the past and no one and now they're doing it um and they're i think the good news is these people are going to be housed they're going to be safe and have decent rooms over their head and now it's to try to keep them in something decent when they when they leave and when the orders are over so i think the good news is i think some of those people will be sheltered even longer um and also some cities are even legalizing the campgrounds and 10 and 10 cities right now they're and they're bringing in sanitation things so that because they're finding that it's safer for people to be in a tent um, to be further away from each other than in a shelter because of the outbreaks in a couple of the shelter in San Francisco. The traditional model that we've always accepted in the past of the traditional shelter model just may not work anymore. Um, and they're going to have to be doing more things like again, sanctions in cities and there's RV parks for the homeless now coming into LA um, where they've got trailers that families are now housed in safely. Um, tiny homes. So I think now it's just, it's nice. I'm, I'm actually excited and optimistic that some of these temporary solutions will become permanent solutions. And more people who at the end of the day, 12 months from now, we're going to look back and we're going to be like, I can't believe no one ever let that happen before. What were we thinking? Because um, I think there's more sanitation stations now um, in, in the downtown areas and, and portable bathrooms and things than there ever was. And I'm just hoping that those become permanent fixtures and more acceptable now by the NIMBYs that have never allowed for it before because they did not want those um, homeless in their backyard. Great, thanks. Our next question comes from Anthony. Um, regarding the Senate Ho Housing Production Working Group, this is the one that included Senator Atkins and seven other senators. Do you have a read on their progress or what the, out like the outcome will likely be? And uh, we know that there was um, a conversation that the pro tem had with her members that she made it very clear that she's still working on that. Uh, she was basically gonna move forward 11 pieces of legislation this year because of everything happening right now with COVID. She decided to reduce her bill package to two. One of them is production. So we know that that is a big priority for her. It is something that the caucus really cares about and will continue to work on. Um, but do we have any other details at this point to share with the group? I don't think we have any details, but also again, yesterday for some of you that were on um, the webinar with Scott Wiener, he said 15 to 16 bills um, will be the best bills. Um, we'll continue to move forward. So I think we all know Senator Wiener and, uh, and production will be a, a part of those of that package. And I think we're all optimistic that those conversations that you just talked about, Graciela, started before the pandemic. I, they're still continuing during the pandemic. The members have, are working, the staff are working. Um, they're still conducting stakeholder meetings and conversations amongst themselves, they're just not public. And so I'm very optimistic that there will be, uh, the, whatever housing package, they always they call it a package, I hate calling it a package, but there will continue to be um, a production package um, as, as there was last year and there was a year before and Graciela, when you were in Jerry Brown's office, there was a housing package. Every year there's a housing production package. Um, so I'm, I, you know, we're, we know that there's going to be housing legislation that's adopted this year in production for sure will be a, a, a big, large piece of that puzzle. Great. I think to that point as well, you know, Holly's talking about production where we will see um, some bills, particularly related to the other P's that we talk about, you know, we talk about three P's. We will also see some in the preservation and protection space, tenant tenant protection bills, um, specifically, you know, trying to provide some resources and um, an aid to tenants right now. Some of whom are, you know, worried about evictions um, or, you know, making up for lost rent and landlords as well, who, you know, some of them may be experiencing hardship for, from losing some of that rent from, from folks. So um, I think that that is important to note that there will be, you know, preservation, protection and production. And we still, you know, are hopeful to see each of those P's, um, each of the three P's moving forward. That's actually a perfect segue for our next question. Uh, our next question comes from Aiden. I heard that the Judicial Council gave a blanket extension of deadlines for filing CEQA lawsuits. 
Can you tell us more about what is happening here? So <laughs> this is a bit of a technical question. Um, I, don't, I don't know if Holly has thoughts on this. Um, the Judicial Council, I think it was Emergency Rule 9, waived a lot of um, particular deadlines as it relates to um, the court system, filing deadlines and whatnot. And they have pushed quite a few of those out, um, CEQA being one of them that has allowed now for a longer response time. Um, and that is concerning for a lot of folks that are in the housing space as um, that is in and of itself um, a law that impacts uh, folks' ability to develop in California. I think CEQA has, um, has a great place and is very important, but it continues to be a barrier for folks as they try to develop and one that we um, are going to continue to have to address um, as we see this crisis continue. Um, I don't know if Holly has additional thoughts on that, but um, yeah. yes, that was something that the court um, that the courts did that judicial council pushed. And I, I think it is actually a good partner with an earlier question somebody had about a meeting housing element and um, and just the timeline, the deadlines that's happening right now is everything's been you know postponed 30, 60, 90 days. The judicial council's decision is concerning across the board. Every lawyer, land use attorney, developer, association, anyone building anything is petrified over this decision and the additional delays that it's causing on top of more delays. I think though on the positive side, I always, I'm, I'm the optimist, ironically, in the group, and I always talk about my crystal ball. Um, um, and I, I do believe this is going to actually help pass legislation this year that's going to be doing things to make CEQA and sell exemptions and exemptions that are on the books that are just not useful. There's going to be legislation, possibly a, a real, true, um, genuine effort to try to make those existing exempt exemptions more useful so that projects don't get stuck in the CEQA. Um, process and, and subjected to this new rule. Um, I think then there'll be more just things looking at streamlining and efforts and just fine tuning um, a lot of those laws that are on the books that are just not useful. So I think that's again my silver lining and thought that the only thing, the only good we can see in this Judicial Council opinion is it could actually help um, push David Chu and uh, Chairman Laura Friedman, both are co authoring a bill um, that's supposed to be focused on that. Um, and I think this decision just helped light a fire under that effort um, to do something and do something significant this year for housing projects. Again, for housing projects. Um, one of our next questions is from Emily. Does anyone have insight on how state funding, specifically rental assistance, will reach undocumented individuals and workers and their families? That's a really good question. Um, you know, the, the undocumented workers, I mean, I think right now, um, there's going to be there's already new legislation being proposed to have legal counsel and access to legal counsel and get funding to have people to have uh, that can't afford attorneys um, to be able to have attorneys. Um, I, you know, I think the state of California we've already seen has already taken actions whenever there's a federal action that does not allow it to trickle to an undocumented individual. They take an action to make sure it can. Um, also, as many of you know, um, rent controlled units do not require documentation um, and means testing or any sort of income testing. And those units and those individuals are protected under the local moratoriums. Um, and so I think, it, it, I think that depending on the situation and the folks that are filing for unemployment, I think that's the big concern is a lot of undocumented people are now unemployed. Um, so I think the, the best advice I would try to give to folks is the, the, how they're handling it for unemployment is likely the method that would be used to handle for the tenant protections as well. Um, but the state of California, fortunately, tries to make sure they can, <laughs> they'll address that issue and make sure those people too um, will be qualified for relief and be able to negotiate with their landlords, whether they're documented or not for a payment plan um, and hopefully be able to avoid unlawful detainers. And, and then again, hopefully they get their jobs back and can ultimately pay for the rent and not get evicted and have to move. Thank you. We're getting a lot of questions again about legislation. So here we go. Our first question, or our next question comes from Michael. How should we identify the bills most, most likely to move this year and focus our advocacy efforts on those? And I think as, as we were just saying earlier, 
just because the legislature is not in session in Sacramento doesn't mean that they're closed for business. They are definitely listening to their constituents. If you or have the ability to send email, fax, they still have faxes, by the way, um, or just send in even a letter, tweet, Facebook messages, any way of communicating right now, a lot of the members are very active. They're listening to their constituents. So please let them know, even if there's a piece of legislation that might be difficult because it costs money or might not be able to move this year, they are gonna be reintroducing a lot of the legislation um, in January of next year. So something for you to keep in mind, I think it's really important for them to know what issues are important to you as uh, constituents because a lot of that feedback then informs a lot of the decisions they take either on existing bills or bills that they're gonna um, help move forward next year. So, so some, any thoughts on that? Yeah, one thing I was um, thinking about too is that, you know, folks that are um, dialed in today that are, you know, uh, joining us for this webinar, you're already doing a lot more than other folks. I would say, you know, make sure you're checking the, the action alerts and the information that you're getting from folks like Beria and SF Hack, um, as well as California Yimby. These are organizations that are very dialed in to the process that um, have a really great you know, understanding of uh, the legislative process and, and what bills are gonna be moving forward. Um, and that's what, you know, we're here to help support with. And so if you're able to, you know, sign up for their action alerts and whatnot, that's a really great way to find out what continues to move forward and to have, you know, those action items in terms of how you can get involved and what you can do to help um, support these important pieces of legislation. Our next question um, is, from Isaiah, is there a particular number of bills each Senate committee will be reviewing or number of bills the senators are allowed to carry? When will we know which bills are moving um, and when they are being discussed? Will there be an official list or are we just waiting for the committee agenda? I think we need a magic ball. <laughs> yeah, I, I think so. Holly, do you wanna take that one? I think again, right, I mean, again, that, this one is, that, that question is like the toughest. I think it's still a really unknown, but we will know more on um, March 4th when they come, I mean, May 4th, we will know more then. Well, actually, and, and there is, allegedly, there might even be a policy committee um, that's happening on the, on the first day back or the second day back. So we know that at least a week prior, usually they will have, will post the agenda and when bills will start getting referred. But we know that on Monday, the assembly desk is gonna finally be open and bills will finally be able to get amended. Those bills will then finally get start getting referred to committee. And so by the end of next week, I think we will have a better sense and idea of which bills, because even I just got off a call today, that I'm gonna be combining two bills into one. Um, you know, and, that, and that bill might even take three other bills into one. So I think right now it still is a little too early, um, but by the end of the next week, as we get closer to the back, we'll have a better sense um, especially when the assembly desk finally gets open. Yeah, I think that um, to Holly's point, when the assembly desk finally opens, we'll, we'll have a better idea. Um, you know, at least on our end, we continue to work with many of our clients and stakeholders um, with, with the hope that many of the bills that we have been working on are going to continue to move forward. And um, we don't always know. We are hearing that um, legislators are um, being asked to reduce their bill load, but internally they um, are, you know, having these conversations with their staff and they're still trying to determine what bills they themselves are going to move forward and what they will be um, able to move forward. In some cases, you know, at least we've heard in the assembly, you know, they're deferring to the chairs to, of each committee to help decide what bills are heard. And so I think that that's something that's it's from from what I have heard is a little bit different than how they're proceeding in the Senate. And so we're still working on, um, you know, understanding whether they're in assembly offices or Senate offices as they work through their bill load and, and what they prioritize. But I think it's actually um, safe to also say that neither house, even though each one is kind of looking at bills a little differently, neither house has told their membership if you have a cap on bills, I think they really are relying on each individual member, the needs of their individual communities to kind of make that assessment for themselves. Again, understanding that the budget projections are completely different. A member has to take into consideration all of those different factors. And that's one of the reasons I think that, that both leaders have decided they're not gonna say, hey, you can only carry five bills, or two bills, whatever that is, it's really up to each member to decide what is the prudent number for their office. 
I think to that point as well, importantly, some members have bills that previously had nothing to do with COVID, but they are able to find a way to help tie that into the relief efforts and the response efforts. And, and that may be true for, for some authors. They may have more bills that are directly related to what we're seeing the needs that have arisen since the pandemic. And so that gives them a little bit of flexibility to determine you know, which bills in their package they um, may need to move forward, as Graciela said, for their community and, and to help address some of the most urgent pressing issues that they're seeing arise. And, and just kind of adding to that, and I think what's also important is right now California, California is looking at the COVID crisis, but we're also heading into a summer, summer month and normally with that, unfortunately, comes wildfires. So that's another thing. I mean, right now we're just looking at COVID. We're still talking about a housing crisis that has not gone away. If not, in fact, it's going to be exacerbated. And on top of that, you know, we did not get a lot of rain this last fall. So that means we're going into another fire season, which we have no idea what that's going to um, entail. So all of those different factors are going to impact what the legislature ends up prioritizing and when and how. So there's a lot of uncertainty going into this year. But I think, again, we have very smart leaders. We have a lot of um, constituents that are involved and engaged. So yes, definitely sign up for a lot of the YIMBY alerts. That's going to keep you up to date as to what's happening in Sacramento. Um, okay, so our next question comes from David. Many proposed ADUs for the elderly and disabled are not deed restricted affordable. And so many cities and counties have not approved these as exempted construction projects. Is there a conversation about clarifying the restrictions for people in potentially injurious environments, but who are already have a roof over their head? Good question. That's a good question. I will say I was on a webinar earlier this morning, and this is specifically related to construction and um, building in the Bay Area, in the, the Bay Area region. So this, I will caveat and say this wasn't a statewide conversation, but um, from my understanding and the conversations with folks on that, on that webinar, um, there are a lot of conversations that are taking place right now about ways in which um, we can move forward with allowing additional construction in a safe manner, um, particularly when it comes to vulnerable populations. Um, you know, the concern is that the, the public health order that came out um, in the Bay Area region on March 31st was so restrictive and um, a lot of folks have concerns that that 10 percent um, number that uh, they were allowed to continue building if that if they had 10 percent affordability on site um, was a bit arbitrary and so we're hearing from a lot of folks that there are conversations right now that are happening daily um, about how they can address that when they do um, revisit it because that expires next week um, and how they may uh, relax some of those standards while keeping you know social distancing and, and safe operating procedures in, in place for folks that are building. And also we're starting to hear more and more that a lot of the ADU is really going to be a, a way of solving the housing crisis, especially if we go into another big recession like we did. If everybody remembers, it took us years before you actually started to see any multifamily production happening and really kind of in earnest. And so what we're hearing from some of the developers is that a lot of the money has dried up for a lot of these projects. And so it really is going to be the smaller projects, such as an ADU or, you know, um, units that have four or less that really are going to move forward and help us get out of this crisis. So I think that's going to be a renewed focus and interest, um, both at the state legislature and also keeping an eye out to make sure that those approvals are happening at the, at the local level. Um, so our next question is from uh, John. Is there any update on Assembly uh, Member Wick's statewide rental registry bill following AB 1482 and the emergency orders related to the pandemic? Being able to know what is happening with rentals in our cities would be incredibly helpful. It's true. Um, I don't know specifically if we know what, what's going to happen with her bill, but I, I know that in the conversations we've had with her office, it's something that she still thinks that type of information is really helpful. And as the lack of data actually makes it difficult for us to move forward with policy conversations when we don't know what the rents are in every jurisdiction, really understand is it going up from year to year by how much. And so I think that this part of the conversation, even if it doesn't move forward this year, that the legislature is going to continue to come back and have these thoughtful discussions because that kind of information is valuable as we continue to move forward with um, policy in this area. Yeah, we're just going to add that just unfortunately that bill is a great policy, but it falls into that category of 
additional costs um, for you know, potentially the locals as well as the landlords and just more costs on business. And right now, anything that's going to be increasing costs and making it harder to do, to do business in the state um, or any extra burden on even HCD and any registry, I mean, any bill even requiring more work of the state, uh, it just, it's going to just be really tough this year. But it's a great policy and Gratzko is actually right. I mean, someday we will have a registry because that information and that data is needed. Um, well, we're getting close to time here. So this is really, this is what's really exciting to see the interest uh, of the public. So um, I actually, I think, and apologize as I'm trying to scroll through my iPad and make sure that I'm getting back to all the questions. I think we covered most of the questions that you guys have asked, but if we have missed something, please send an email. I think Lewis from California Yimby will send out um, the a couple of links for you to, to basically use. Also, any other questions that we did not get to, please feel free to follow up with him and we will do our best to answer them. Any final questions before we end? Really, thank you for spending the time with us. Oh, we have one more, last question. Um, this is from Al Altaira. Are there any initiatives to loosen the restrictions on placing temporary shelter units or on private property? in light of the um, coming economic depression? Yeah, actually there is uh, already, I think local cities that are already entertaining ordinances and, and that would allow for even short term for RVs and to have like things and be having hookups on driveways and having um, tiny homes instead of an ADU, which many of you may already know it's very expensive um, to, build an ADU to the standards that are required today, but they're already looking at things that have more flexibility to maybe have something that's on wheels that could just roll into somebody's backyard, roll into somebody's driveways and just do things to help temporarily. And again, I feel like some of these ideas were already being generated before March, 7th, uh, March 17th. Um, so I think some of these things may actually become permanent in different jurisdictions, things that were never allowed before um, could could be even um, some of us worked on a bill that was, you know, trying to change the 72 hour parking requirement and six months ago, you thought it was the end of the world in some cities when you were trying to do that. But now it's a, like a different environment. Um, people are, you know, sleeping in their cars and, and now that folks are looking at having, you know, trailers and RVs and motorhomes are what are now people's shelter. I think we'll see more cities um, doing that. And I also think it looks like the state, I've already seen some proposals of leg legislation to maybe have legislation that clarifies that it can be permitted, clarifies that the cities can do that. Um, for some, again, NIMBYs that don't want to see that type of um, small and temporary um, housing going into their communities, I think you might see some, especially during the state of emergency, there may be some legislative action that gets introduced um, from some members of the Bay Area. I don't want to let too many cats out of the bag, but there's definitely members that are considering um, legislation right now that would allow for that. Great. I'm making sure that I'm not missing any questions, so bear with me. Sorry guys, I'm having some issues with my, with my iPad. Um, Great. I think, unfortunately, that's um, the time that we have. I owe one other one. When will the HCD director assume the new role? Oh, that's a really good question. I don't think it's been made official, but I think we will see him pretty quickly after the start of the new year. I mean, not the new year, not the new year, the new month, May. I think May 1st, it hasn't been made official because, again, with a shelter-in-place order and someone trying to move and come to town, it's, it's uncertain, but I think we will see him in early May. At least that's what I've heard from agency. Great. Well, thank you, everyone on the call for um, actually allowing us to spend a little bit of time with you as we shelter in place and take it one day at a time. So everybody, please stay safe, wash your hands, and just remember to be kind. <laughs>